السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد I'm so humbled to see all of you and it's difficult to follow in the footsteps of our dear teacher and Imam Suhaib we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him and his family steadfastness and to benefit through him and yet I'm incredibly grateful to Allah for the blessing of this convention and the blessing of discussing this incredibly important and timely topic and I want to reiterate what Imam Suhaib taught us that this is in no way to select a group of people based on where they were born or where they were raised. This is not to be disrespectful to the pioneer Imams, some of whom were from this land and others from abroad, who paved much of the good that we enjoy today. But it is a statement of what types of people do we need to lead our religious needs in our masajid, in our universities, in our Muslim institutions, in our communities. And I reiterate the words of one teacher who said, a generation gap is just a statement of how disconnected you choose to be from those that are a different age than you. And so I iterate also that when we talk about the need for American cultured Imams, it's not about where they were born or where they were raised, but their conscious choice to rely on Allah and gain the cultural literacy that it takes to deliver the glorious message of Islam to our people, Muslim and non muslim and as I think about this responsibility, I come back to the Holy Quran, to the verse in Surah Ibrahim where Prophet Ibrahim reminds us of one of the key responsibilities of an Imam, and that is to dream, to chart out the direction, the vision, the structure that will take people closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. And where we must start our journey today, and I'm going to endeavor to be very practical with you. And I pray to Allah that Allah opens the heart of a young person that makes this moment the moment that they choose to serve. That makes this moment the moment that they choose to give back. That makes for that young sister this moment the moment she chooses to follow in the footsteps of the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Because you see, Prophet Ibrahim, he started where we need to start our journey, and that is sincerity. He did what is truly unimaginable for any father or any mother, to leave his family, to leave his wife and his infant son Ismail in a barren desert with no material means for survival. And yet it was in that moment that the first step of the journey was established, the step of sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so throughout today, I will give you as many practical resources to build strong people as I can afford and as I have learned from my teachers and colleagues. But understand this, if you start with a sincere intention for Allah and renew that intention, Allah is going to take care of your journey. Allah is going to take care of your journey. And Prophet Ibrahim, he started with that sincerity and he left his family at the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when he left them, he had a great vision a great imagination for what Mecca could be. This blessed place on earth, how it could serve for generations to come to connect people with Allah Azza wa Jal. So can you imagine if Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala were to bring His Prophet to life now 
and he were to see that. You see, before this great scene of Allah's worshippers existed in reality, it existed somewhere else. It existed in the dreams and imagination of Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam. And now, when we talk about the need for American cultured Imams, our statement is to find the Bilal's and the Khadijas and the Abu Bakr's of our time that will imagine how we get out of our reality and not to our Mecca, but our Chicago, our Washington DC, our Los Angeles, our American and current reality where people can be connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In many ways, my brothers and sisters, you know, if you asked me just about two and a half years ago, if I wanted to serve as Imam, I would have laughed at you with all due respect. I would have never imagined it possible. But when I was asked to serve as Imam, I reflected on this verse quite a bit. Because in a sense, my responsibility, my infinitely smaller responsibility with my family became that. That became my new home. The Islamic Association of Raleigh in Raleigh, North Carolina. And stepping into that responsibility, I was overwhelmed. Filling shoes that could not be filled with an excellent imam of 30 years who had charted the direction before myself trying to work together and so in some sense my family in carrying this responsibility became them our congregation at the Islamic Association of Raleigh and like every transition before this one in the days that led up I was trying to prepare as best as I could I dusted off the books of fiqh and our old class notes I imagined having to issue opinions and teach all day and I imagined my biggest friend, my most important tool in accomplishing that responsibility would be this. That my most important work would be accomplished behind a microphone. I can say now how naive I was that there is not a thing that could have been further from the truth. There are questions that I get that I don't know the answer to, but I never lose sleep over them. Because there are good colleagues that I can ask, there are books that can be consulted. But what I didn't know at that time was in that first week, I would meet more refugees than I had met in the previous 30 years of my life. And while that says something about the Imam position, it says something so much more uncomfortable about the bubble that I had built around myself. When I met that, that woman, that sister in our community who had just been afflicted with great hardship, lost the breadwinner in her house, children to be responsible for, I lost sleep over that family and how to help them. When tragedies struck and the tragedies come closer and closer to home every day, I lost sight of that. I lost sight that those were the challenges that were most worthy of being faced. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to look carefully at the screen and I'll show you five pictures. And I want you to pick out what the five pictures hold in common. Are you ready? You don't sound very ready. Are you ready? All right. So here's the first image. Shout out, what do you see? I heard halaqa, I hear lesson, I hear masjid, I hear teacher. I see, I hear youth. Here's image number two. What do you see? I hear earth, I hear soil. I hear planting, I hear cultivating, I hear future, 
Here's the third. What do you see? Cemetery. Graves. Anybody recognize which cemetery? This is Al Baqiya in Medina Al Munawwara. Very good. So that's the third image. Here's the fourth. What do you see? I hear struggle. I hear hard work. I hear, I hear business. I hear elderly. Okay? Here's the fifth and final image. What do you see? I hear sujood. I hear prostration. I hear salah. I hear brotherhood. I hear Muslims. I hear masjid. So the question is, what do the five images have in common? You know, each and every one of those pictures has a hadith or multiple ahadith indicating a incident in Sirah where the Prophet ﷺ taught the companions about things. Each of those are prophetic microphones. Each of those are teachable moments. And in many ways, the struggle of our generation to understand Islam can be summarized in our infatuation with YouTube and quick help and quick lessons and our inability to attract the teachers and imams and chaplains that take us through teaching the way the Prophet ﷺ taught. Because in those moments, are the gems of a thousand lectures. In those situations, in the moments of silence, are the lessons of a thousand years. And in the best teachers that you'll meet in your life, they will teach you in their silence far more than they will teach you in their words. My brothers and sisters, in the minutes that remain, I want to give you some practical tips and tools because I know many of you and especially young people are thirsty for how we can take what Imam Suhaib taught us and how we can take the great message of this convention and put it into action and carry our share of the load. So we start with a sincere intention and recognize that most of you will never be Imams. But each of you will have an opportunity to contribute and give. And in the moment when you are called upon to give, it is then that you will wish that you have planted and invested for that day what will help you deliver the message. And so let me give you some practical tips on how to learn. The first advice I'll share with you is to learn gradually. And YouTube has its place and there's a lot of good there. And the internet and articles have their place and the weekend seminars have their place. But ultimately there is no substitute for starting young and starting gradually and going piece by piece. You cannot cram for the exam in a way that you can study for it gradually over time. And in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentions as a part of it, وَالْقَصْدْ الْقَصْدْ تَبْلُغُ That piece by piece, element by element, slowly, and you will reach your destination. So the person today, the young woman that says, I want to be a mentor, so that young girls don't have to struggle as much as I did. You have to commit to that today not when you're called to the teaching platform. The young man that says that I had a rocky road to come to this convention and I don't want people after me to struggle against that. You have to commit today to start your journey. And the person that is upset about the way that Islam and Muslims are portrayed in politics, in pop culture, in media, 
you know, your emotions are not fully sincere until you have the courage to put it into action and start the journey today, even if with a small step. And as you look at that journey and you learn gradually, there's another important point that many people miss, which is to start local. I see people with lots of energy that want to go overseas and you ask them what they're going to learn and in reality they're going to start learning Alif, Ba, Ta and the Arabic alphabet and Juz Amma. And they think they're going to think, sit with some big scholars. The reality is the resources here they teach in just about the same way. Minus the language immersion, there are excellent resources here. So it was the way of the scholars of the past to exhaust local resources before seeking to travel and go beyond. And I will tell you, my brothers and sisters, not out of knowledge, but out of experience, there is nothing that I regret more from my learning journey as a younger man than not taking advantage of the gems of local imams that were right there under my nose. Wallahi, I make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make istighfar to this day that while my mind was caught off with some big name sheikh or some faraway land, that I missed out on valuable years of my life where the local imams and teachers had so much to offer that I missed out on. So if you're wondering where to start, start with the Qur'an. And if you're a parent looking at your child, raise them to learn broadly and learn from lots of people. But when you're choosing their first Qur'an teacher, choose with the selectiveness of a pinhole. Not just someone that can recite, but someone of character. Someone of congruency who models in their action what they recite from their tongues. And learn the Arabic language. There's so many resources now with, with Bayina, with Fawake, with local teachers here in Chicago, in so many places across the United States. There are opportunities to start that journey. And the sincere student will take that journey all the way to their grave. They will never graduate from being a student of the Quran. Never. And it is enough of honor for the student of knowledge to consider themselves a small student of the great messages of the Holy Qur'an. As you learn locally, and this was mentioned earlier in an earlier talk today, in Islam we don't have a separation between the sacred and the secular, between the so-called Islamic or Sharia sciences and a separate universe from the other sciences. So I'm telling you, if you want to be a good Muslim, but you're doing a lousy job in school, you're not where you need to be yet. What you see in front of you is the pillars of service that we have at the Islamic Association of Raleigh. And as you can see, the office of the Imam and our leadership team is tasked with so much more than leading prayers. With all respect to leading prayers, you see that people come to our center to celebrate the birth of their children and to mourn the loss of their loved ones and to accept condolences and to have the body washed and to perform marriages and to get advice in divorce and to find guidance for young people struggling in their deen and to find company for elderly people that are looking for services. Every week we have group after group of non-Muslims that don't understand the Arabic terminology. Last, week, last couple weeks ago when we asked, 95% of the people raised their hands and said they had never met a Muslim in their life. Some of them were 75 years old. So if you want to serve, it's not enough that you have a nice voice in recitation. If you want to lead, not as a desire, but if you want to be ready if you're called on, then you have to have broad experience. You have to do well in school. You have to make small mistakes before you have big responsibilities. You have to be in extracurricular activities and be out in sports because ultimately our community is not looking for an inspiring lecture. They're looking for leadership and guidance 
on how to get out of one of the most challenging environments in history and find closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal. And breadth and depth of experience cannot be substituted as tools on that journey. Next, the scholars say, woe to the one who his teacher is his book because his mistakes will be more than his correct statements. If you want to go on this journey, you have to humble your ego and you have to find people that are better, smarter, sharper, inshallah more pious than you and sit at their feet and learn as their student. Without this, every scholar of the past traversed this path and without it you shall never find knowledge. And Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Mubarak says, Al-isnad min al-deen, wa lawla al-isnad laqala man sha ma sha. If it, that this continuing chain of narration, this learning from teachers is from our deen. And if it were not for that, then anyone could say whatever they like. And that is the plague of the Facebook scholars and the internet scholars. So don't follow their mistake and humble the ego and find the teachers. They might be hidden, they might be unknown, but they're worth every drop of sweat that it takes to find them. After that, I know many of you are full-time in school or at work, but really the resources that we have, and you can take a photograph of this or go back to the, to the recording, but there are so many institutions now that are providing continuing Islamic education on the nights and weekends. You don't have to give up your day job. You don't have to turn your back on your life. If you want to specialize and be an imam or a chaplain or a scholar one day, that's one thing. But most of you, that's not your path and that's okay. But you can learn of the deen what will empower your journey. And Places like Al Maghrib and Medina celebrate mercy and Oak Tree Institute. All of these offer weekend education. And of course, I mean no disrespect to anyone that's been omitted from the list, but from the volume of places, I've just highlighted some. And of course, I encourage you to seek out resources in your local areas as well. In addition, in the United States, we have an increasing number of residential programs at different levels. Some young people are taking advantage of the Bayina Dream program, a one-year immersive in uh, Dallas, Texas, where you learn the Arabic language in a very compressed and powerful curriculum. And the Qalam Seminary, also in Dallas, as well as Faweka and the up-and-coming Boston Islamic Seminary, all of these have different intensives, summer programs, year-long programs, and so on, that offer opportunities for those that are looking for something here in America where you can take your education to the next level. But really, I want to open your eyes as we close to something that I think many of you don't know exists and is an incredibly empowering tool. If you're in the smallest town in the Midwest, if you're from a small college town and don't have a lot of Muslims and teachers, we have an unprecedented number of highly qualified teachers that are leveraging technology to teach online. Places like Studio Arabeya, many of these places have booths in the bazaar. Go get their literature and ask them questions. Where you can learn via Skype and private tutoring or classrooms. Quran and Arabic language if you have trouble finding local teachers as well as more advanced topics. Places like the Cambridge Islamic College where I completed a diploma in theology, logic, and philosophy that was incredibly empowering as I was pursuing my degree at MIT and many, many other places as well. These are resources that shouldn't be missed. And finally, we have many, many colleges and seminaries that are coming up, that are training the next generation of teachers and chaplains and imams and scholars here in the United States. So after today, I pray that 
knowledge of these resources is not an excuse for anyone to put off their journey. I pray that each of you that feels that spark in your hearts has the courage and motivation to move it. And I also pray that those of you that choose to dedicate your life and profession to this, and one day perhaps consider traveling to learn in the great centers of learning overseas. I hope that today, Imam Suhaib and myself have motivated you that when you make that decision, you're doing it to be among the best and brightest, inshallah. That it's after you acknowledge every drop of potential you have to work and start that journey right here at home in the United States. Inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he blesses us with the next generation of rising leaders and imams and chaplains and scholars that will guide our way religiously out of the difficulty we find ourselves in. I pray to Allah that he finds in our midst and blesses someone that will outclass and people that will even exceed our esteemed teachers at this convention. I pray to Allah to grant us steadfastness and to increase us in knowledge and to accept from all of us. Allahumma ameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.